Hi, I'm Michael again, and today we have Dave Swift from Client Amp with us. And many of you may be familiar with who he is. I mean, he's pretty active in the group, and I know he's very active in multiple groups. And so, I'm glad to have him with us today. Um, please introduce yourself, if you will. Yeah, Dave. thanks for having me, Michael. I mean, you might not remember this, but actually, the first interaction we had was I sold you an LTD. You now did. it was legit. I know some of the the lifetime deal trading gets like a little shady. I asked the uh, manufacturer if it was okay to sell it. He gave me permission. I don't know if you're still using it, but that's how we first connected was I sold you like a proof that's, plugin and uh, right. all these uh, Facebook group messages later, here we are chatting on, uh, on this platform. Yeah, here we are yeah, we're working right. on a project after that, but you want to buy that back by chance? I don't use it at all. <laughs> uh, I tried to give you warning. Like this isn't my favorite plugin. Anyway, we don't know. You did. You <laughs> did. Under the bus here. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. I'll just tell you real quick kind of uh, what it is that I do. Um, so I started an agency with my wife uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, you know, it's kind of the, the thing to do at the time. You see a lot of agencies popping up. Everybody's got an agency. My wife has a history of working in the dental industry. So we're like, all right, sweet. We're going to start an agency. We're going to help dentists get more customers. Um, we did that for a little bit and figured out that that wasn't really... Uh, you know, this is part, I guess, of, of starting a business is that you start out with one intention in mind and then you get into it and you think, well, even if we were really successful at this, this isn't exactly bringing us the life that we want, right? Just mm -hmm. the nothing against dentists. They just, we weren't a good fit for each other. Our um, way that we want to live our existence uh, combined with how a dentist needs to run their practice despite our contacts, it just didn't seem like a good fit. So uh, over the, the course of the last 18 months, we've kind of been trying different niches and um, uh, we actually built a course for my wife along the way, she, she does fitness stuff. Uh, so now we're kind of moving into 2019 with this new direction of helping online creators, people that are doing membership sites, people that are doing um, you know, online courses, things like that. Um, my specialty is really in, in paid traffic and, and sales pages. So um, that's kind of where the bulk of my day-to-day -day life lives right now is, uh, you know, reaching out to online creators, helping them grow their businesses, which is why I'm so active in the Facebook groups. I actually find quick little tip, like helping people on Facebook groups, they just message you and then ask to hire you. It, like it works. Uh, the more value you can provide them to those people that are having uh, you don't have to be pushy and like sell stuff. I see a lot of people like PM me and I'll, I'll give you a price. If you just like give them the answer, they'll be like, can you do this for me? Cause that's a lot of work. So that, that works really well. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that's how actually we became, you worked on a project with us. Was, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're a good, <laughs> good example of that. We did some copy for your, uh, for your recent launches. Congratulations on that, by the way. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your help on that. They've been working out pretty well. I My appreciate pleasure. all that. <laughs> so I know that, and we talked about this a little bit prior to getting on the call. Um, these are not always about WAS, but I know that you had some experience with it or, or thinking about it or yeah. whatever. Um, tell us a little bit about that. In your well, you know, I've, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Like I think a lot of people who get into this world, it's hard. Like people on the outside think this is simple, uh, but we probably work more than, you know, if we just had regular full-time jobs. Right. Uh, so uh, being an entrepreneur my entire life, I think, man, this looks like an exciting business to get into this WAS idea. Uh, and then I, you know, install multi-site, uh, get WP Ultimo, start trying to set everything up. I get your plugins, trying to set them up. And it's just like, oh, this is not going to be, and rightfully so, uh, it's not going to be like a set it up on the weekends type of business and then just start running traffic. And all of a sudden you're going to have uh, hundreds or, or thousands of customers. No, this is a huge investment in time. So where I'm at with the, the WAS thing right now is uh, I'm kind of wait and see. I'm not like, I don't think it's a, a terrible idea, but I want to see the demand from customers. I want to see someone like really crushing. I want to see multiple people doing really well with their WAS before I'm able to commit the number of hours uh, and resources necessary to, to kind of do it properly. Right. You know, you got huge players like Squarespace and is running Super Bowl ads. I know they're not a WAS, but that's the competition. So, um, a lot of local businesses that we work with have their sites on Squarespace. 
Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The difference that we find anyways, that we try to focus on is making it so that it's very niche specific so that they're getting what the tools that they actually need instead of just getting a random template. And that's kind of our focus point, but no, I agree. This it's definitely not an easy thing. It's a, um, a daunting task to say the least to build out a WAS yeah. and then not, and building it is just actually just 50% of it. Right. And you still have to market it and make sure you're reaching your target audience. And do you pick the, did you pick the right niche to begin with? And, there's a lot to it for sure. Yeah. I think, you know, part of what you're talking about with specializing uh, and making sure they have the tools that they need is, is kind of educating them so that they know ahead of time, the tools that they need. And it might not be this way in your industry, but in a lot of industries, people are just like, I need a website. And I don't really know what that means. I just am told I need a website. They don't think about, do I need online sales? Do I need to be able to book? Do I need, you know, there's like, you know, it's, it's, if you're not from the marketing world, Mm-hmm. And you just think about a website, you think it's just kind of like a place to show what you do. This, a lot of local businesses are still at this point. Um, online people, like, you know, people that start businesses to do e-commerce or to create uh, online courses, they kind of already get that. They understand that the website is a selling tool. Um, but people who've already been like running a, like a brick and mortar business for a decade or, or longer, they have a harder time kind of rationalizing that. It's not just a place for them to talk about upcoming events at their, at their shop or something that it really is the introduction of their business to their customers. So that's part of it. What I struggle with, with the idea of a WAS is that how much time can I commit to educating a potential customer um, in terms of like, you know, the, the cost to acquire them and then how much that, what the lifetime value of the, the customer will be. It seems like those are going to be pretty thin, thin margins. Unless, you know, if, if you have like a particular niche like you do, where you already know that niche really, really well, and you can probably convey exactly what they need in a few sentences, maybe it's a lot easier for you. Um, I don't have yeah. <laughs> that, that in my background, so uh, it's, it's a hold up for me. One of the cool things about WAS, or at least the concept of the multi-site, is that it makes things more efficient. So if you did have a specific niche that you're targeting, then you can actually get them, like you can go one-off websites, but just get them up much quicker by selecting from a, you know, a group of templates and then just kind of doing it all for them. That's, totally. That's kind of where we've evolved to because at the end of the day, people don't want to, at least in my experience in this, is that people really, I've found, don't really want to learn um, go through the process of learning how to build out their own website and they get frustrated. Like they have great intentions. Like the pricing is great and it looks like you, you have, you solve all my problems, but the, the issue becomes is that, the, you know, they're still a learning curve no matter how, how easy. And I talk about this in other uh, interviews, but there's no matter, no matter how easy the page builder is, you still have a, a huge learning curve. And so, yeah. And, but I think that's going to be that way with Wix and Squarespace. So, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is there. I think, I think you got it a little bit right where we're talking about, you know, focus on the right niche and have to truly understand who your target audience is so that you're providing the right tools for them. But totally. for sure. Yeah. So tell us a little more about like what you, who your target customer is. I know you mentioned that, you know, there are other internet marketers and so forth, but what exactly um, services would you like to provide? And, and yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, Ideal client for, for clients AMP is an online creator that wants to focus on creating content that they love. So like, you know, um, some of our past clients have included, like uh, we have someone who does recipes, right? And they, they specialize in a very particular type of recipes. And that really is what they love. Uh, the whole act of selling their recipes, their membership site uh, is, is not even something that they are against. They just, it's not on their radar right? Uh, so if you're not, I said this before, but if you're not a marketer, thinking in marketing terms doesn't come natively to most people, especially creative people that might already have a following. Uh, you see this all the time. You look at like, in fact, I was looking at a guitar lesson website or not a website, but a YouTube channel this morning. Um, and it was this guy. I, I've been a professional musician, a little background. I've been a professional musician um, basically since I was about 15 years old. Uh, I did that up until I was in my mid thirties, started having kids, can't travel. So that's when we shifted into uh, digital marketing. So I was just kind of, uh, you know, looking at this YouTube channel, this guy had, I think like 120,000 subscribers. The video I was looking at had over 700,000 views. And he's got a link to his Patreon account. And I'm thinking like, you know, now I'm past the point of being interested in the guitar lesson. I'm looking at the business aspect behind it. So I'm like, well, how much money is this guy making? 110 
or 120,000 subscribers, click on his Patreon link. He's got uh, one pricing tier for his Patreon. It's $3 a month and he's got 600 subscribers. So it's like, man, you have a base of over 120,000 people and you're, you know, the videos are very successful, getting lots of views, people enjoy the content, but because he doesn't have that foundation in just asking for, for value, for the value that he provides, it's not even like, you know, I'm very, I'm very about like ethical salesmanship. I don't like trying to do, like you hear about these sales funnels where people like, uh, rope you into reoccurring payments when you don't understand. And that was the old days of like the dark ages of the internet. Like, oh, sign up, buy my supplements. And then all of a sudden you're, you're receiving supplements every month and you didn't realize that you subscribed to a reoccurring payment. I'm not pitching that, but like there's got to be a way for this guy who's working his tail off putting out guitar lesson videos on YouTube to make more than 1800 bucks a month uh, from his loyal following. And so that's kind of what we want to do is not just, you know, guitar players, but anyone who wants to create content, any business that needs to provide courses or uh, a membership portion to their business, we want to enable them take the tech away, take the marketing away so they can just provide their valuable insights, uh, to their customers or to their audience. Oh, that's awesome. That's sounds like a very specific niche there to find those. Yeah. Customers. That's <laughs> No, I I, uh, ran, before I did digital marketing, I ran a music school uh, for a little over a decade. So I have a a background in teaching, like working one-on-one with people and uh, helping them understand how complicated things work. Uh, So I feel like this this niche came really, really natural to us, um, being that, you know, it's about teaching, it's about helping people get information. So I I can connect with with creators uh, kind of immediately. You know, we, we just kind of align our viewpoints and I understand what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, they want to get paid. You know, sometimes they want to get rich. That's fine. Everybody likes money. Uh, <laughs> but most of all, what they want is to be able to keep doing what they love. And in order to do that, you have to make a living. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of living, tell me more about your professional uh, musician career. <laughs> what that look like? Sure. Well, uh, so I started uh, playing guitar at a very early age, uh, started playing in bands you know, playing in bars, things like that. I ended up going to Berklee College of Music in Boston, got a degree from there, um, ran a recording studio kind of right out of, out of college. Then I got uh, picked up to be in a, a touring band. We were playing, you know, 200 shows a year for, wow. yeah, playing colleges all over the, the Midwest and, and uh, down South. And then, you know, we're starting to get older at this point, right? So it's like, <laughs> I'm done with college. I've ran a recording studio. I've been in a touring band. And uh, then the lead singer, who was uh, very, a devout Catholic, he's decided it is time for me to have children. So <laughs> that was the kibosh on the band. We didn't try to find a new lead singer. He was kind of the, you know, the, the main, it's like Van Halen could have just stopped after David Lee Roth left. We decided to, to, leave, to leave it as, as it is. And uh, at that point, I started, um, actually, I worked for Apple for a, for a short period of time, just working in their retail store. Well, I built up a roster of, of music students and eventually like the entrepreneur, uh, a lot of people don't realize that being a musician really forever, but especially in the last 20 years has meant that you're an entrepreneur because there really isn't anyone that you can trust to help build your career until it gets to the point where it's worthwhile for someone to help you build your career. If that makes sense. You have to have a large enough following before, you know, the, the Hollywood idea of what being a musician looks like. Yeah. I've heard that labels don't pick you up unless you have a good solid following already. Right. Yeah. And it really has been that way since the early two thousands. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it it becomes increasingly more so that we have this wonderful testing ground called the internet where it's like, uh, as a label, it makes just way less sense to invest in as many artists, but I digress getting off topic here. So, uh, (laughs) so the, the point is, that I've been, you know, even as a kid, I like, I would sell, I would have my mom go to, to the like uh, Costco. It was called something different at the time, but we'd go to Costco and I'd buy a box of suckers from, uh, from the candy aisle. And then I'd go to school and I'd sell them for a quarter, 50 cents each. So this $5 box of suckers, I ended up making $25 on. Uh, and I would do that once a week. And like, that was my first business. And I, all the teachers let me do it because they thought I was like fundraising. And I never said it was. But it was just kind of like, David's a sucker guy and people go buy them for me. And that was when I kind of got addicted 
to this idea of entrepreneurship. Uh, so coming out, coming out of the band and working at Apple and seeing how hard it was to work at a retail job, I was like, man, I got to start a business. And that's when I started uh, a music school, got some of my old musician buddies. Uh, and it was, you know, not to like be stereotypical about it, but it was kind of like school of rock, right? We we're teaching little kids how to be rock stars. And we put on recitals where they're, uh, you know, doing rock and roll songs, playing Iron Maiden for their parents and scaring them the daylights out of them. So uh, that was a ton of fun. And uh, we never really made, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard business. You're not going to become rich doing that either. So, uh, but what it did teach me over the course of 10 years was like going from never running a real business to, okay, now I got actual liabilities. <laughs> I have, you know, rent to pay. I have uh, employees to pay. Really learned how to actually run a business as well as I got to find some way to market this thing because, you know, we need to have a website. We need to have, we need to worry about our SEO. We need to get paid traffic. I learned all of these skills, not because, uh, like I, I want to find some way to, to make money off of them. I wasn't trying to like, let me start a digital agency and then I'll take a Facebook course on Udemy. And then all of a sudden I'm an expert. No, this was a process of, we have to do this or we don't get to eat. So, uh, <laughs> I learned that over like, you know, basically from 2008 to 2017, I was doing digital marketing for my own business. Uh, and I actually started, um, I've always been a bit of a nerd, but I actually started with Squarespace uh, in the very early days of their e-commerce when they first introduced that. I was like one of the first shops that set up because we sold musical instruments and stuff at the school as well. Uh, so we were selling our stuff online through Squarespace and just hitting so many um, like roadblocks in terms of we want this feature, but it's not supported with Squarespace. So eventually I learned WordPress. Uh, not very long, honestly. We were probably with Squarespace for like six months. And then I was like, okay, this is not working. Someone turned me on to WordPress. This is probably like 2009 or so. And uh, it was just, I've been pretty much diehard WordPress advocate, uh, you know, for the last decade or so since then. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. At what point did your wife come into the picture? Because you mentioned you work with her and that's an interesting topic in and of itself. Yeah. Because... <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Um, my wife was actually a guitar student of mine. She was not a child. I should clarify because it made it sound like she's full, she's an adult. She's a year younger than me. Uh, but, uh, she, yeah, she was a singer. She had a YouTube channel, um, you know, kind of, uh, but that was a hobby. She'd always been a singer. She was in the military. She sang, uh, you know, she actually got to sing the national anthem at a Minnesota Vikings, Green Bay Packers, uh, football game. That was like her big moment. Uh, you know, it's playing a singing in a stadium. That's pretty cool. Um, so she came to me kind of shortly after she'd done that and she's, uh, her partner from YouTube was, uh, actually being deported. So he was, he was here, uh, from, I don't know the details of it, but he was, uh, going to school with her. She was becoming a dental hygienist and, um, and he got deported. So he, she no longer had a partner to sing with on, on YouTube. So she needed to learn to play guitar for herself so she could continue on YouTube. And that's, um, kind of the beginning of our relationship, uh, which, you know, she quickly, she started helping out around the school. Um, and you know, things just kind of progressed from there where it just made sense to, to continue our partnership. And then when we decided to, uh, kind of move out of the city, we moved, moved more into the suburbs and, uh, it just, Hey, well, you got all these connections with, uh, dentistry. She's a very outgoing person. She's much more likable than I am you know like people meet her and like uh, you know they want to keep talking to her, her then. <laughs> <laughs> she's just that person that like you know is is lights up a room and so uh it, it was made sense that okay you're gonna be the person who's gonna uh go and talk to these businesses and uh tell them about what we do and then I'm the nerd I can do all the WordPress stuff in the background or I can set up the Facebook ads and and drive traffic so um that was kind of our our partnership and how how things came to be and is that how it's currently set up still or did she get involved with the WordPress stuff as well and became a nerd? <laughs> no. Uh, in fact, the other night she asked me, what is WordPress? I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I explained it to her again. No, um, you know, but what's nice is that she can relate with these business owners on a non-technical level. And like, she knows what a website is and she knows how to buy stuff online and she knows what ads are. And she just talks to them like a normal person and that that makes them feel more, I think as marketers and technicians, sometimes we uh, do 
tend to muddy the waters in terms of uh, confusing our, our potential clients on what it is they actually need. They, they just start simple and then we can, we can slowly ramp up to finding out those details as the, the, prog- the project progresses, if that makes sense. Um, coming in with like, we're going to give you this, this, and this, and like, you know, all these uh, stats Giants. or features rather than telling them the benefits. Cause you know, it's, it's old news, but really all business wants is more reliable business. They want more customers, more money. Yeah. It's easy to do for sure. Like talk about funnels, talk about, you know, just all those different things that they might need. SEO, like many people don't even know what SEO means still, which is crazy. What you think, like everyone knows what SEO is, you know? Right. Or if they know what it is, they just know that they need it. They don't have any idea. Like a lot of people, um, especially when we were focused more in the local uh, business niche, a lot of the business owners I would talk to you, they would, they would feel burned because they've already spent, spent money on SEO and not seen results. Uh, and it, it was usually they spent too little, like they're, you know, the, the amount of money that they put into it isn't reasonable to see results because SEO takes a lot of time. So if you're going to get an expert, they're going to be spending a lot of hours trying to help your business grow. So you can't expect a two or $300 a month SEO package to really produce results and certainly not in a short amount of time. So just setting those client expectations in terms of like, well, if you've only got two or $300 to spend per month, this is gonna take a really long time. And even if you have a bigger budget each month, it's still gonna take a really long time and we can't even promise results. Like mm-hmm. that's SEO. I mean, it, it's competitive. I think there's, um, what there was a, a Neil Patel video the other day. He said, there's been 1 billion blogs put on the internet in like the last 20 years or something, 1 billion. So there's 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, You're now competing with 1 billion other blogs if you start one right now. So to think that you're just going to write some blog posts and that's going to help your website rank, that's kind of an old way of thinking. We need to to move beyond that, which is why I love paid traffic so much. Because Mm -hmm, if you've got, if you've got credibility, like if you got some social proof that you're not a con artist or a thief, you can pretty much turn on the ads and, uh, you know, at least begin testing, at least see if your stuff works. It's not a, let's write 12 blog, blog posts and wait a year to see if people find them. And then if they convert, like that's yeah, a that's long process. Too. I mean, just getting on the first page is one thing, but to convert it, like for them to actually take action, click on it and, and do something and make a call. It's, it's definitely the challenge as well, where with paid traffic, you can, you know, you're only paying for what you're, what you're doing. So, yes. Testing, it's, you know, as marketers, we need to be testing all the time. All, all the time. I saw that you recently put up a post, like a big win that you had too with your Facebook marketing for a client, I believe. Okay, so you're checking out my website. It, uh, <laughs> we're, we're in the middle of making this pivot that I was talking about. So we had our, our website up until maybe like Thursday of last week. So a little, as we're recording this on a Wednesday, it's been almost a week that we took our website down and kind of put a coming soon page up, which I hate doing. Actually, the website's totally done. But now we're filling it up with blog posts, exactly what I was saying <laughs> not to do. But um, I'm a big proponent of this idea of, you know, if anyone out there is watching this or listening to this and they're a marketer um, and they're trying to get more clients for their business, uh, I really, I, I've been through, and I know I've I said I only have done this for 18 months, but I've been through the process of, of reaching out to people on LinkedIn and reaching out to people uh, through cold email and cold calling businesses and even just going into businesses and talking to the owner and like, you know, trying to build a rapport. Um, And the problem is with all of those things is everyone's doing it or it doesn't scale. It's just, it's, you know, in terms of of cold emailing, uh, I'm sure there's someone out there that's getting results, but it's not me. Like if you're better at it than me, that's awesome. Cold emailing in 2019 feels like uh, death. Like I, I just feel sick to my stomach when I think about my campaigns going out and then just getting those big F you replies, you know, like everyone gets those, everyone that's done cold emails, like F you like, take me off your list. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to try to sleep at night knowing I'm driving people insane because those emails bug me too. And I get them all the time. Like, Hey, we can help grow your agency. So my point is if anyone out there is listening to this and they want to get more clients for their agency, leading with content, like whether it's reaching out to people through Facebook and helping them or creating uh, amazing blog posts or just free tutorials, guides. Uh, you look at, at someone like w- WP Crafter who has made his entire YouTube channel 
uh, and, and he does, you know, apparently quite well. Like he seems like he's, he's uh, pretty profitable at what he's doing. Um, and it, all he does is put out free help for people. Like he helps thousands and thousands of people every day. Um, and I bet if he wanted to, he could turn around and start offering web design services that were, you know, the 20 or $30,000 websites, the, the type of, of websites. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just because he's got this reputation. So, uh, it, I'm a big fan of not, not, well, to, not to cut you off, but there's a quote ahead. by Zig Ziglar. Have you heard of that one? Uh, it's not how much, it's, what is it? The more people that you can help get what they want, um, the more you'll get what you want or something. Oh, yeah. What you did, but yeah. Absolutely. No, that's perfect. Uh, and then if you look at like Dan Kennedy, uh, who's a famous copywriter, uh, kind of, of the, he still does stuff in the internet age, um, but he was even before that, direct, mar direct response marketer. And, um, you know, he built his entire business on creating uh, information products. Right. So he makes hundreds of thousands of dollars doing copywriting. That's his craft. That's his what he's a technician at. Um, but people don't just call Dan Kennedy and hire them. They buy his products. They become a member of his inner circle. And once they've like kind of worked through his value ladder, then they can get to the position where they can actually hire them, hire Dan to work on his business. So I love that idea of kind of filtering out your clients based on uh, who you can provide the most value to. Uh, and, you know, this kind of gets into, I'm going to write about this. I'm going to have, have some stuff. I, I, I plan to anyway, but choosing who you work with as an agency, I'm coming to learn is probably one of the most important things that you can do. Now, when you're just getting started, you want to work with anyone. You just want a client. And I totally get that. But if you get three or four bad clients, your life is ruined. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like they can suck you of all of your time. And they're not bad people. They're not bad. You know, it's, it's not like they're, that's their intention. Um, but one of my friends uh, who has a, he does email marketing. I'll give a little plug here. Um, he does email marketing for uh, e-commerce websites. His website is yourloyaltribe.com. And so if you have an email marketing excuse me, if you have an e-commerce website and you want to get more sales through, through uh, e-commerce, or excuse me, through email, I'm butchering this, uh, you can go check out his website. But he said something to me, we were having coffee a couple of weeks ago, and he said something to me that was kind of really changed how I looked at my clients. Um, and hopefully none of my clients are listening. But he said, <laughs> before you take on a new client, like you need, he said, you need to be able to sniff out good money from bad money. And before you take on a new client, you have to think, would this client succeed without me? So we've all gotten pitches. We've all gone after business owners that are just starting their business. Um, and you have to think like, if I don't help them, if I don't do their marketing for them, if I don't, you know, provide this service completely done for you, will they still work hard enough to succeed? And if the answer to that is no, run away. Because those are the people that anytime anything goes wrong, that's not even related to your service, they're going to expect your help. That scope creep starts to come in. Um, but the, the people who are, it doesn't matter if they have already, you know, some people say like, Oh, I'll only work with people if they make X number of dollars per month or something like that. I don't even believe that. I just want to see proof that this person can succeed without my agency, without having outside influence. Like they're, they're the type of entrepreneur, the type of hustler that has their head in the game. And those are the clients that we want to work with. So I want to set up um, kind of information products to help everybody get to that level. And then once they're to that level, that's when I want to jump in and just really help them explode uh, and go to the next, to the next tier of their business. And that's, that's the beginning of the post that you saw. You mentioned at the beginning of my little diatribe here uh, that uh, you saw a post on my website. Yeah, we did just recently help a client go from 5,000 a month to their first $40,000 a month. Uh, it all happened within about uh, six weeks. So I'm going to be writing more about that uh, in, the, in the very near future here. Well, that's awesome. Uh, with all of that, give me your top 10 Udemy courses that uh, made you an expert. I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are some good Udemy courses. Honestly, the Isaac Rudansky, I know it was a joke question, but I'm going to answer it. <laughs> Isaac Rudansky courses are phenomenal. Uh, Isaac Rudansky is, he has a PPC agency. Uh, and he's got three, maybe four courses on Udemy. I haven't, he just did a, a, 
a partnership with Mobile Monkey and he did a messenger bot, mm-hmm. of course. I haven't seen that one. But he's got a an AdWords course, which is like 30 hours long. It's super wow. thorough. And he's very articulate and well-spoken. That's awesome. So if you just want to go crazy on AdWords, 10 bucks, you can literally become an expert. Um, the other one he did was a conversion rate optimization course where he talks about building websites uh, so that people you know, sign up or buy or do whatever they need to do. That was a really good course as well. And maybe those are the two that I've taken from him. But um, yeah, so those are my two. I probably only have those two as my favorite Udemy courses, but there are some gems in there. People mock Udemy. I I do think there's some value to be found. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier in the conversation. So I thought I'd just throw that in there. (laughs) Uh, What about um, other thought leaders are people in the marketing space that you're following? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm following Billy Jean. He has good content, stuff like that. I saw you posted about his course. Uh, you you took his course. It was valuable. Yeah. yeah. It's very valuable. I think um, he's, you know, I've seen him around for, I don't know, the last couple of years. He's, he practices what he preaches. He, you know, he does all the retargeting and all that stuff. And um, yeah. I just kept pushing it off, pushing it off. And I finally decided, you know what, I'm at a point, especially, you know, actually it's funny because it's my WAS and the plugins, the two things coming together that made me realize I really want to start pushing them on Facebook because I, I do, I do believe in paid advertising. I think that is the way to go. And so it, he just happened to, put his ad in front of me again at the right time. And I, I signed up for it and he just took me through his ascension ladder. And now I'm a full fledged, you know, <laughs> it's marketing works. It's proof. It's proof for sure. Yes. But it doesn't take much for me. I, I'm one of those guys that buys like every single freaking LTD. So <laughs> it's yeah, it's, that's a whole other episode, right? That's an addiction. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, yeah. So I've seen the Billy Jean ads on YouTube. Like he's hit me with them, but I never really engaged with them. It just never caught me at the moment where I was like, I need to learn something. Um, but the, the people that, and the video is always, he's an engaging person. Mm-hmm. And I saw that slide from the recent uh, thing about uh, how butts are dominating in 2019. Did you see you know what I'm talking about? It's from the, the yeah. conversion conference, whatever that just happened. I thought that was awesome. And it made me want to. I think Adam Preiser from WP Crafter put that up. If I'm not Yeah. Mistaken. Yeah. It was in one of his videos. I saw it. Yeah. Uh, it made me want to watch his whole, his whole speech. So I probably would enjoy his, his course. Uh, the first product kind of information product that I purchased was uh, from Derek Halpern actually uh, back in like 2012 or something, uh, which was blog that converts. And so, uh, I really liked, I, I, just, I still kind of like Derek's, uh, ML. I just like how he does things. And, um, I, he's out of the course game now, but I, I don't consume as many, uh, courses these days to learn marketing techniques as I do to learn technical stuff. So if I'm like, okay, I need to learn how um, this software functions and I need to learn it by this weekend, then I'll, I'll go on Udemy and buy the course or whatever, you know, wherever the best outlet for um, that one technical thing. And I just kind of download the knowledge into my brain. Uh, in terms of learning marketing at this point, it's not that I'm done learning. I'm definitely not. Um, but what I've found to be more beneficial is to kind of study what they do, not what they say, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So um, I like Frank Kern a lot. I think he's got some great talks on YouTube. You don't have to even buy these products. You can really learn a lot from how he approaches things. Um, and if you just watch like what he's doing right now, um, he's going live on YouTube pretty much constantly. Um, you can look at his copy and his images for his Facebook ads because Facebook, uh, a blessing and a curse to all of us Facebook marketers, we can now see each other's ads by <laughs> going to the page and clicking the little ads and info button um, and just really studying the format of other people's copy um, rather than hearing a tutorial about, you know, here's, here's the components. Cause I feel as though much of that information is often regurgitated. So like if you've taken um, for example, let's say you took a course from, from Billy Jean, uh, you probably don't need to take a course from Derek Halpern because the, the content is at least if they're on the same topic, the content is usually pretty much the same and they just kind of put new labels on things to make it uh, relevant to, or, or, you know, so that they're kind of claiming ownership of the technique. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's uh, another Dan Quint Kennedy uh, idea is that you never start an ad from scratch. You never start writing copy without starting with a successful, someone else's ad that's successful. So anytime I'm going to start a new Facebook ad campaign, 
I go through and I study all of the other businesses in that same industry and see what ads they're running. I try to keep an eye on it for a few weeks, see which ads stay up, you know, because they're, being, they're testing stuff. If they have 20 ads up, uh, choose the three or four that are still running after two weeks. Um, then you know that those are actually profitable. And you can kind of start, it's not plagiarism, it's definitely not plagiarism, but you start to, to borrow from those ideas um, just in terms of, of what, how they structure the offer, where they put the offer, how they get, get attention, um, how, do you, how do you get someone to click, what does the landing page look like? You, know, you just kind of start deconstructing that, that side of things. And, and yeah, go ahead, it looks like you want to say something. No, I just, I'm listening. Um, okay. I, you know, I think Russell Brunson, he actually coined the term, right? Funnel hacking. So it's kind of the same concept that you're talking about. You want to go through yeah. every Another, it's a perfect example of like Russell Brunson was a student of Dan Kennedy's. So he took Dan Kennedy's idea of never starting uh, an ad from scratch. And he put a really catchy name on it. Funnel hacking. We all know that. Got funnel hacker t-shirts, hashtag funnel hacker. Uh, so it's just like, you know, the kind of cyclical nature of, I want to say incestuous, but there's, there's some component of like, we just kind of keep eating our young and regurgitating the same information in marketing. Uh, there are really, that actually brings up a good point is that there are fundamentals of marketing and you need to follow them. If you don't, you're probably not going to be successful. Like so many people get so complicated so quickly with their, their marketing in terms of like, Oh, I got to have, you know, a remarketing campaign for people who have watch this video 50% clicked on six pages on my website and uh, you know, fill out a form. Okay. Those people are just going to get this ad. And it's like, unless you're doing hundreds of thousands of, of views to your, to your pages, that's not, it's not helping you. It's, it's actually going to increase the cost of acquiring rather than just blasting the same ads to people, you know, six or seven times uh, until they, you know, remarketing that actually works. Uh, if someone's clicked and showed engagement on your site, you want to get them to see that ad like five or six more times, um, contrary to what some people think about like frequency on, on Facebook. But yeah, different. Yeah, stories. there's like a statistic that's been going on probably since I was a kid. Six people need to see something. I think the numbers actually change depending on who you're talking to, but I've heard like 6.7 times before they convert. Yeah, totally. Uh, so in what I was kind of referring to, I guess I didn't do a good job of giving the full picture, but uh, when you're running Facebook ads, there's an actual parameter that they give you um, called frequency. And that's how many times people have seen your ad. And it's pretty well known that if your ad gets to a frequency like above four or five, it's no longer profitable and you need to find new creative. But that's for cold traffic. That's for people who have not shown engagement. So if you're just running ads to like an audience that doesn't know who you are and you run it to them three or four times and you're not getting engagement from them, probably time to find a new creative or a new audience. However, when people click on that and then you, you know, you use your pixel, you cookie them and you run ads to them again, you're going to take the exact opposite approach. After you get above six or seven, that's when you start to see the conversions happen. And that's what we're talking about. That's the old thing that you, you brought up of like, you know, seeing something seven times before you, you trust a brand really. So yeah, it's, Right. Yeah, it's that the whole process of getting someone to know, know like, and trust you and, and see you multiple times for sure. Yeah. There are so many pieces to this marketing game, isn't there? Like that you can learn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. It, it's, it's definitely uh, something that you really only should do if, if you like can be comfortable being a nerd for like 90 hours, 90% of your waking hours uh, and kind of obsessing over the latest techniques and strategies and, and how you can, can kind of, I, the way I, I explain it to people is it's like I'm playing a video game. Like you like Fortnite a lot. I like marketing a lot. You want to get the high score in Fortnite or you want your team to win. I've never actually played Fortnite. Uh, <laughs> you want your team to win. Uh, and I just want to get the high score in marketing. It's not, it's not about greed or making more money. It's like, how can I do this? So it's like effective and, and inspiring people to take action. That's really exciting to me. And I don't think you can really like, just develop that, that excitement. I think it has to kind of be something that naturally, um, not saying like you have to be a natural born marketer, but you have to naturally be passionate about like seeing the KPIs. Like if, if those things make you go like, Oh, I don't care about this. That's when you need to hire someone like me, <laughs> right? You, you want your results. You don't want to learn a whole other, uh, you know, craft that you're not uh, excited about learning.
Yeah, totally. I agree. Um, I want to kind of go back into something we were discussing a little earlier, and this is probably more of a personal um, interest of my own, but you say you work with your wife. How does that work out? Because I know like for my situation in marketing, and you mentioned this too in the conversation that you're constantly working, you work long hours is more of like, it's a lifestyle more than it is a job, you know, like you right. really, and it, it takes over everything. Um, with working with your wife and, and, and hearing what you say her role is as far as sales, um, how does how does she take it? And how does it work out for you guys? Uh, well, we also have uh, four children, th three with my wife, one from uh, marriage before I met her, uh, that they're all young. Like they're all, we have seven, five, three, and one. So um, it's like, you know, that alone <laughs> is a full-time job. So my wife's duty during kind of the normal nine to five hours uh, is kind of stay at home mom uh, type of thing. And then kind of after dinner time is where we usually catch up with business for the day. And, um, you know, because we're not doing the local business stuff as much, her, her role in the sales part has come down considerably. So yeah, I mean, it's tough, like just, uh, to have the understanding of the, the roles in a relationship, which are already hard, right? It's hard to have uh, a successful marriage or relationship oh, yeah. of any kind. That's a challenge. Then you add business on top of it. And it's like, there's no separation between, between money uh, for the business and money for the family. Oh, and mm -hmm. so that, that can definitely start to, to blur the lines and really just open communication. And like, um, as you can maybe tell from this interview, like I pretty much just speak my mind. Like if something's happening, I'll try to explain it in the best like most clear and articulate way that I can. Um, but yeah, we definitely uh, have a hard time uh, managing that during different periods of time. Like right now we're in Minnesota and we've, we're coming out of two months of the worst snowfall in Minnesota history, right? We have about, wow. we still have about six feet of snow in our driveway. Um, so we haven't been going outside a lot. We haven't been, you know, it's like the weather has been negative 40, negative 50. I work from home. We've got all these young kids running around. My wife's taking care of them during the day. And it comes like, you know, seven o'clock. And it's like, honey, we need to talk about the business. And she, you know, rightfully so is exhausted, does not want to, to get too deep into that. And you just got to realize like, these are the circumstances. This is what's going on in life right now. And sometimes we can wait a day, you know, it's, uh, that's okay. But um, yeah, so she's still a big part of the business. Um, but uh, right now, like with, with our, our infants and everything, it's like, she's kind of taking a little bit of, of time off for that. Oh, that's nice. That's, that's nice that you're able to provide that enough yeah, for her right. to do that for sure. Yeah. Like with me, I have the challenge of, you know, I'm always working. I probably work till one, two o'clock in the morning, most nights and, and yeah. working during the day, trying to run multiple things. I probably put too many things on the fire, you know, too many irons in the oh, fire. Absolutely. <laughs> and in order to do any of it right or good, you have to spend the time. And so it was just a curiosity because, you know, I talk about it with my fiance about possibly joining up and working with me. And because the whole idea of being able to travel and just do things and not, you know, she, she runs her own business, but she cuts hair. So she couldn't like necessarily trap. She can leave when she wants, but she's not making money when she leaves. Right. So, you know, try to think of how do we incorporate her into the business. But even more than that is like, it's hard for some other, like you said, relationships are tough, period, you know, and yeah. for someone to um, just be working from to one, two o'clock in the morning on a consistent basis is, is a, a challenging also. And then you add your, you got four kids. So I, I mean, I don't know what time you work until, but um, it's. <laughs> that's, that's, I used to be like you, I used to work basically until I passed out, but maybe it's age or just. Um, you, you can't know, be that, but that old. How old are you? Uh, I'm 37. So okay, you're younger than me. <laughs> like it, it definitely <laughs> changed for me where I can no longer exist on, it's probably like having infants yelling and stuff, um, all night long or, you know, the kids yeah. wake up and it makes it, it wrecks sleep, but basically nine o'clock hits and I'm done. Like, um, you know, my, my day, my average day kind of looks like, uh, wake up, uh, if a few days of the week, I have to bring my, my daughter to school. Um, she lives with her mom half the time. Uh, and then we, we usually go to the gym, have lunch, and then I start working. 
Um, and so we'll, I'll work kind of in, from like noon to nine. I know I said that, like I check in with my wife around seven, but usually we do kind of like this meeting after dinner time. Um, and so my work day is like, you know, eight or nine hours. And I really can't sustain that uh, regularly if I go beyond that eight or nine hour window. Um, I just get burned out and I don't, especially when you're doing creative work. Like I mentioned, I was a musician. So what I like about marketing is that it's got this creativity to it but there, um, you get paid because musicians don't get paid. <laughs> there's, uh, there's this creativity to it. And if you're writing copy as like part of your job or you're, you're designing websites or, or whatever it is that you do that has a creative element, um, it's a huge struggle for so many people to stay creative consistently. Like, I mean, just think about your favorite artists. They might go, like music, musical artists, they might go two or three or four, or if you're Guns N' Roses, 17 years in between albums, because being creative on command is a very difficult thing. And obviously, copywriting isn't entirely creative, but there is, there is your, some days you're on and some days it's like, oh, I'm just, I'm hitting my head against the wall. So I think actually when we're working on your project, uh, doing copy for some of your, your landing pages, uh, it was one of these stretches where my infant got the flu or not the flu, but like really bad cold. My two-year-old got a really bad cold. I got a really bad cold. And then it was like negative 60 and schools were closed. So we had all four kids home all day long. And I was like, Michael, I'm going to be late on this. There's just no That's right. life. Life is hitting hard right now. And then, you know, you get through it and like, it's like almost 40 degrees today. Stuff starting to melt and <laughs> like 40 degrees. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, come from, from uh, Prince, uh, obviously from Minnesota, said famously in his Oprah Win Winfrey interview that he lives in Minnesota because it's cold enough that it keeps all of the bad people away. And I firmly believe that it's only good people in Minnesota because you have to be absolutely insane to live here 12 months out of the year. It's Is that where you were born and raised? It's where I was born and raised. I lived in Boston for five years uh, when I was out, out doing school and, and, and doing music out there. Uh, but then I moved back for some God forsaken reason. Uh, but if I hadn't, life wouldn't have turned out as, as it has. So yeah. Have you traveled much? Have you been to California or anything like that? I have. Yeah. I've been to California several times for, for music endeavors. Oh, that's uh, right. Have you, have you uh, always lived in California? I have. I've lived here since I was born, but I moved around within California, but yeah, I've always been in California. Yeah. I, I like California, but I was always glad to leave. No offense. Like, you know, I'd go to LA or um, like there's a music conference in, in Anaheim. We go there every year and it'd be like, I might've just been like the, what we were doing too is, you know, work. It's like, all right, I am ready to go home now. Uh, so something about the, the culture is just different than, than the Midwest, which I really. Um, oh yeah. East, East but, coast yeah. lifestyle is hard. Like living in the East coast is uh, way harder than living in the Midwest because it's just, it's just harder. Uh, but you know, the West coast is, it was kind of the opposite. It was too far the other direction for me. So <laughs> the one thing I do like about it though, I mean, I'll just give you guys a quick little view of what the van looks like today. Nice. nice. Outside. <laughs> so that is one of the advantages. Let's of see being. if I can do the same thing without showing you my lights. Oh, uh, I don't know if I can. There we go. Oh yeah, look at that oh, yeah. gorgeousness! Oh, yes, no. <laughs> Just blowing out the camera with uh, whiteness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gray and white for like four months, and then everyone uh -oh. gets depressed. <laughs> <laughs> What's a good time to come visit when it's not snowing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Summertime. <laughs> uh, that's the thing is we have amazing uh, springs and amazing amazing summers is what everyone forgets. It's kind of like uh, childbirth. You hear. Women uh, supposedly often forget the pain of, of going through childbirth. They don't even remember it because, because the, the child is so beautiful. Well, that's a, a summer in Minnesota because we don't even forget the pain that we just went through. It's like, oh, it's, I'm telling you, man, nothing feels better than 80 degrees after negative 40. It's like, <laughs> I bet. That's crazy. Karma or like yin yang. <laughs> How funny. Well, we're rounding up our hour. I enjoyed our conversation. Is there anything that you would like to add that we may not have talked about? Like maybe something that your, when's your website come out and how can you help those that are maybe watching this? 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I appreciate you having me on. It's, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you. Um, so my website is, uh, or the agency's website is clientamp.com and you can go there and sign up and uh, you'll get a notification when uh, the, the new website launches. We're gonna have tons of new content on helping people that, so if you're in the early stages of like planning out an online course or a membership site, definitely go sign up. Um, I'm doing a lot more on YouTube as well. Uh, I mentioned WP Character. Adam has been uh, super encouraging to me to get on YouTube and do more stuff. Uh, he's like even left comments on videos like, you have to make more videos. And like <laughs> if that guy tells you to make more videos, I guess I'm going to, to do it. Yeah. So that's the plans kind of coming forward, um, which I had more to, to show your audience right now. But uh, I think our, our first few blog posts and videos should be going live in the next week or so. Awesome. I can't wait to check those out. That's, yeah, that's great. Be. Well, thanks for coming on board and um, giving us all the information that you shared with us. It's good stuff, man. I appreciate it. Great to chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, take care.